next recap and reactions video along with an NFL Week 7 waiver wire ads video. So if you play fantasy football and you'd like to skip ahead, feel free to check out the timestamps down below. If not, then you have come to the right place. Uh, here we're going to go over all the action from Week 6 of the NFL, starting off with Thursday Night Football. So on Thursday night, we had a matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks. Both teams competing to get back towards the top of the NFC West. Uh, Seahawks started the season undefeated at 3-0, but then it fell to a record of 3-2 entering this matchup. And the 49ers, with a surprisingly bad start to the season, sat at a record of 2-3. Now, after their matchup on Thursday, the 49ers are managing to come back to an even record at 3-3, three and three, handing the Seattle Seahawks their third straight loss, uh, and so the 49ers win this game 36-24. In the game leaders, we have, for the 49ers, Brock Purdy leading the passing with 18 of 28 passes completed for 255 yards and three touchdowns. In the running game, we do not have Jordan Mason, but instead we have uh, Isaac, Isaiah Guarendo, let me double check on his name, uh, Isaac Guarendo, Jordan Mason exits this game for just a couple plays, um, before coming back and then leaving for the rest of the game once again with an injury, so, uh, I believe it was a shoulder injury, we'll have to keep track of that, and then finally in the receiving game we have Debo Samuel, uh, with an incredibly efficient day, three catches for 102 yards and a touchdown. Now for the Seahawks, in the passing game, we had Geno Smith leading the way with 30 of 52 passes completed for 312 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Then in the running game, we had Kenneth Walker relatively bottled up in this one with 14 carries for only 32 yards, but a touchdown to go along with it. And then finally, in the receiving game, we've got Tyler Lockett with four catches for 65 yards and a touchdown. Now, after watching this game on Thursday night, we've got uh, our two major takeaways that uh, I think are worth mentioning. So, on the 49ers side of things, we have to talk about how they got it done without Jordan Mason. Uh, in the ground game, the 49ers in this one were able to rack up 228 rushing yards. Uh, quite significant, if you ask me. Um, but Jordan Mason, as I mentioned, was out for a lot of this game, so even with him being out, uh, through the help of Debo Samuel, Brock Birdie, and uh, Isaac Gorenda, you know, they're able to get it done, well, that'll be pretty big for the 49ers going forward. They're already down Christian McCaffrey if they lose Jordan Mason as well. You're getting quite thin at that running back position, but 228 yards rushing is definitely going to help you win a lot of games. We'll see how effective they can be going forward. Uh, and then as for the Seahawks, it comes down to Geno Smith. Uh, Geno Smith has had a pretty solid season, I would say. Uh, Seahawks started off 3-0, now losing three games, and it's it's just a matter of being more secure with the ball. Uh, Gino does lead the league in passing yards thus far, um, which is good. But he's also 6-6. Six and six. He has 6 touchdowns and 6 interceptions. Uh, and 6 interceptions, 6 weeks in, is not really going to cut it. He's tied for 2nd place with a lot of other big names. You know, you've got like a Dak Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, Jordan Love. A lot of these guys do have 6 interceptions, but for for the Seahawks in this game, it really came down to his fourth quarter pick. They were leading a comeback attempt, and if he didn't throw that pick early in the fourth quarter to set up another San Francisco touchdown drive, then uh, the Seahawks probably could have actually come back in this game. Um, so, yeah, just gotta be more careful with the football for Gino. You're throwing it a lot, but need more touchdowns. The TD to interception ratio has to be better going forward. After that, we move into a game between the Bears and the Jaguars that takes place in London. Uh, you know, the Jaguars do have somewhat of a home field advantage in London, considering they play a game there every year, but this could not help them in their matchup. Uh, the Chicago Bears end up walking away victorious in this game with a final score of 35-16 to over the Jaguars, putting the Bears at a 4-2 record on the year and the Jaguars at a record of 1-5. In this game, for the Jaguars, we had Trevor Lawrence completing 23 of 35 passes for 234 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. 
in the rushing game, we have Dearness Johnson with the most rushing yards, six carries for 28 yards. And then in the receiving game, we finally have Evan Ingram returning after that week one hamstring injury, I believe it was. Uh, he had 10 catches for 102 yards. For the Bears, we have Caleb Williams red hot in this game, 23 of 29 passing for 226 yards, four touchdowns, and one interception. In the rushing game, DeAndre Swift again, another impressive uh, outing, 17 carries for 91 yards and a touchdown. And then finally, in the receiving game, Cole Clement with uh, five catches for 70 yards and two touchdowns. And in terms of the law offense, we had the Jacksonville Jaguars with 278 total yards and the Bears with 373, so almost 100 more. In terms of key takeaways from this game, uh, if you're Chicago, like, I think you just needed more time, honestly. It was... It was just too early in the season. You know, a lot of their offensive woes, they have been able to work through them. Caleb Williams was making a lot of mistakes early on, and now he's put together a very solid start to the season. I believe he's had either nine or ten touchdown passes this year. The Bears' record only stands at 12 for uh, a rookie, so he's going to demolish that, uh, barring, like, major injury in the next game. Let's hope not. Um, and yeah, even with, like, DeAndre... Swift getting bottled up early on now. Their offensive line has got it together. He's had some very solid games, and they're at a record of 4-2, so they're proving a lot of people around, including myself. You know, I didn't think under Matt Epperfluis they were going to be able to do this. I wasn't expecting a winning record after this many weeks, but yeah, Chicago looking quite solid. Uh, and as for the Jaguars, it is... Now the attention has kind of shifted. You know, a couple weeks ago I was talking about how their running game was on point, but the passing game just was not up to par. They finally got both firing on the same, you know, uh, wavelength last week, and they got their first win. But then you've got the running game completely vanishing. Uh, Travis Etienne sideline with an injury. He was already dealing with a little bit of a lingering shoulder injury. Now he's got a hamstring injury. Tank Bixby and Ernest Johnson trying their best to fill in, but also a decently stout Chicago Bears defense. They couldn't take him down. And so yeah, Trevor Lawrence was a solid day. You know, 234 yards passing. Uh, that's enough. That's honestly enough. But you do need a rushing game to complement it, and they just didn't have that. So uh, focus turns to the running game now. After that, we've got a matchup between the Cardinals and the Packers. Uh, this game, we've got the Packers taking it home with a final uh, score of 34-13, to moving the Packers to a 4-2 record on the year, and the Cardinals to a 2-4 record. Uh, in this game, Kyler Murray led the Cardinals with 22-32 of 32 passing for 214 yards and a touchdown. Then, in the rushing game, we had Trey Benson um, leading the team with five carries for 26 yards, and in the receiving game, Trey McBride with eight catches for 96 yards. As for the backers, Jordan Love with yet another impressive day, uh, 22 of 32 passing for 258 yards, four touchdowns, and only one interception. Uh, in the rushing game, you have Josh Jacobs with 18 carries for 62 yards, and in the receiving game, Christian Watson with three catches for 68 yards and a score. Um, sorry, I had this the first time seeing that Trey Benson led this team, so caught me off guard a little bit. Uh, yeah. Anywho, in terms of total offense, Arizona limited to 303 total yards. Uh, yards of offense, and Green Bay limited to 437, not limited, they got 437 yards of offense. Um, the Cardinals had a lot go wrong in this game, you know, you had 13 penalties for over 100 yards lost, you had 3 turnovers, uh, only 89 yards um, on the ground to the 179 of the Packers, so a lot of things you can work on, and ultimately I think the thing that will be brought up the most despite these valid issues is going to be the Kyler Murray Call of Duty deal uh, right before this game. Kyler Murray 
even reference the meme, you know, they've, they've pulled up the stats anytime that there's a double XP weekend in Call of Duty and then Kyler Murray has a game that weekend, he loses the game and plays pretty horribly. Um, and so he kind of tapped into that meme saying like, oh, I know that you haters talk about this, but I've got this deal going with Call of Duty, go check it out. And then to put up a performance like this, like, I don't think that meme is ever going to die. <laughs> and uh, for the Packers, you know, Packers are rolling after um, Jordan Love and then them had a tough time against the Vikings, almost got that comeback, but back to back weeks where they do a pretty good job. And yeah, Love racking up the touchdowns. I think he had four touchdowns in that Vikings game. He has four touchdowns in this game. Obviously, a lot of your interceptions. And uh, the, the thing I kind of want to point out for this Packers team is how their their offensive skill group is, is ambiguous enough that it's almost an advantage. Like, you've got a couple teams where there's no one really good enough to be a wide receiver one. Uh, whereas in this group, I think you've got a, a handful of guys that really do have that wide receiver one type potential and they just trade places being the top dog in this uh, i do think that Jaden reed is probably at the top of the hierarchy but each week a new guy pops off like one week it's not avian wicks one week like this week it's romeo dobbs christian watson Jaden reed uh, all these guys are certified ballers and so uh this wide receiver depth gives the backers like such a such an advantage over other defenses because they don't know who to cover. Everyone is so good. Uh, and so, yeah, just shouting that out. I think that's going to be key to their success. Like, not having one guy that they really uh, do hone in and hone in on. Um, as far as, like, trades go, I hope they don't trade for anyone. I don't think they're planning on it, but, like, this, this group is working for sure. After that, we've got a uh, matchup between the Indianapolis Colts and the Tennessee Titans. In this game, the Colts, they actually end up starting Joe Flacco once again, Anthony Richardson. I thought he was ready to go, and uh, they decided he was not. So Joe Flacco getting a start once again, and leading this Colts team to yet another victory. Uh, the Colts walk away with a 20-17 win over the Titans. Titans now fall to a 1-4 record on the year, and the Colts climb to 3-3, three three, so not too bad. In this game, Joe Flacco went 22 of 38 for 189 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. In the rushing game, no Jonathan Taylor once again. He was also predicted to be back, and then I think on like Thursday or Friday or Saturday, uh, they mentioned that JT would be out once again. So you've got uh, Tyler Goodson. I believe it's Tyler. <laughs> yeah, Tyler Goodson. Um, leading the way with eight carries for 51 yards. And then in the receiving game, yet another impressive one from Josh Downs with seven catches for 66 yards and a score. As for the Titans, you've got Will Levis putting up 16 of 27 passing for 95 yards, one touchdown, and of course, one interception. Uh, in the rushing game, you've got Tony Pollard with 17 carries for 93 yards and a score. And then in the receiving game, DeAndre Hopkins led the way with four catches for 54 yards. In terms of total offense, it actually wasn't that far off. Uh, Indianapolis had 100, sorry, 269 yards to the 241 of the Titans. Now, in terms of takeaways in this game, if you're the Colts, uh, I hate to say it, but I think it's time to get Anthony Richardson out there. It's it's starting to become a trend. Uh, I'm worried about where this team is going if you keep sitting Anthony Richardson. I, I don't want you to rush him out of injury or anything like that, but it's like back-to-back -back weeks where they kind of laid it up to make it seem like he's going to be back, and then he just doesn't play. And obviously you've strung together a couple victories with Joe Flacco in, but look at how your season went last year. Anthony Richardson promising first two games, goes down, and then Gardner Minshew does a solid job of keeping you in that playoff picture, and you like that. Obviously, your players like that, your coaches like that, you want to be a winning team. Now, this year, Anthony Richardson, great first game, but then getting his rookie struggles out of there, uh, he's not doing the best, and then he goes down with another injury, and now your team wins once again with a backup, a more seasoned veteran backup type of guy. But it's like, what do you really want this team to be? Are you building for the future? Are you trying to win now? Like, I don't think you really have the means to win now. Maybe you can get a playoff spot if you play, if you keep playing Joe Flacco, but that comes at the cost of your future because Anthony Richardson is not getting that time and development that he needs. It's gonna 
suck. It's going to be more rough games. They're going to be throws that he misses, turnovers that he, that he makes. But you have to fight through those battles so that you can come out of the other side with your franchise quarterback. And obviously, like, Joe Flacco's not the answer. He's super old. He had a great year last year for part of the season with the Browns, but even then, he, he didn't play well in the playoffs. So, do you want your disappointment later? Do you want your disappointment now? And maybe a happy future. So, I think AR, before you lose more of the locker room, before you lose the fan base, get him back out there, get those losses out of the way, and get him confident and looking sharp. Um, and then for the Titans, I think I think it's not, you know, you can call it pull the plug on the Will Levis experiment. You wanted to see what you had in him, and uh, I, I don't mean to be rude, but like there's nothing there. There's nothing. I, I was not a believer before the season. We're not even halfway through the season. I think it's over. Like, this guy threw for 95 yards in this game. He leads the NFL in interceptions after already not having, like, he had a bye week in five games. He has seven interceptions. Um, every week he does something so incredibly funny, like, so bad that it's funny. Uh, I think this week he ran into a ball boy, and the ball boy had to be, like, airlifted out of the stadium because he broke his leg, something like that. I don't know how true it is, but, like, just, Will Levis is a walking disaster, both on the football field and apparently out of bounds as well. I would not want to employ him, because now you're losing a locker room. Calvin Ridley going out there, talking about how he's upset that he was out without a catch. You paid a lot of money to get Calvin Ridley. Don't let him go to waste. I don't think Mason Rudolph is necessarily the answer, but, like, bench Will Levis. Like, just, just do it. There's no reason to keep playing him. After that, we move into a matchup between the Houston Texans and the New England Patriots. Uh, this one kind of ended up the way that I thought it would. You've got the Houston Texans winning by a great margin, 41-21 uh, over the New England Patriots. Uh, and honestly, even as a Pats fan, I thought this game was a lot of fun. I, I think it was a great outing. First start for Drake May. But before we get into that, let's talk about C.J. Stroud in this Texans passing offense. C.J. Stroud in this game went 20 of 31 for 192 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. In the rushing game, we finally see Joe Mixon return to action after an injury in week two, I believe it was. Uh, and he had 13 carries for 102 yards and a touchdown. And then finally, in the receiving game, no Nico Collins. Uh, he's been put on IR, so Stephon Diggs leading the way with six catches for 77 yards and a score. As for the Patriots, you finally have an adequate quarterback play in New England once again. Uh, the most passing yards in over a year, over a calendar year, believe it or not, under Greg May in his first start. He goes 20 of 33 for 243 yards three touchdowns and two interceptions. And it's not mentioned right here, but he also did have a lost fumble. Um, in the rushing game, you once again have Drake May leading the way with five carries for 38 yards. And then in the receiving game, we've got Demario slash Pop Douglas uh, with six catches for 92 yards and a score. Uh, in terms of total offense, you've got Houston with 368 to the 291 of New England. Uh, and, yeah, let's talk about their key, key takeaways. For the Texans, it's pretty simple. I, I think it was really just a matter of Joe Mixon. This offense was missing Joe Mixon. Uh, the key makers there, uh, I need to check, is it Akum, Akumba Wale or Abunga Wale? Because I've been thinking Abunga. It's Akumba Wale. Akun, yeah, Akumba Wale. I heard Kevin Carl. Kevin Arlen say in the broadcast, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I definitely don't pronounce his name right in my head. Um, but yeah, you, you don't have to deal with Damian Pierce, Dare, and uh, Game Makers as much anymore. Damian Pierce still involved a little bit, but Joe Mixon, very efficient on 13 carries. Like, the Patriots could do nothing to stop him, really. He was running wherever he felt like for a lot of this game. Uh, and I think that's just makes Houston so dangerous when they have a good uh, running game as well. They already had a 5-1 and one record on the season, and that was without Joe Mixon for a decent number of those games. When they healthy running back room, this Texans offense is truly scary. Uh, and as for the Patriots, 
kids are, are really, it's, let's do things, you know, no Ramondre Stevenson, so the ground game was bad in this one, you don't have a single running back crossing 20 yards on the game, uh, Drake May, very effective in the ground game, uh, I like the way that he scrambled, he picked up a lot of first downs on his legs, um, but it was the turnovers, the turnovers were like left, right, center, everywhere, four turnovers for the Patriots in this one, uh, it was just like, anytime something good happens, you also have a turnover to go with it, I think Austin Hooper fumbled, Drake May fumbled, you have the two Drake May picks, but despite all of that, probably one of the most fun Patriots games I've watched, um, just because like, after week one, and I guess week two, it was the same thing, you knew that Jacoby Brissett was not going to be able to throw for more than 150 yards, he's going to get sacked a couple times, and the Patriots offense isn't going to be able to do anything, they can't throw it. Uh, that changed, we saw on Drake May's first touchdown pass, it was like a 40 yard strike into the end zone. Um, he had another very nice touchdown pass, he finished the, the game with three touchdowns and it very well could have been four if they chose uh, to not run out the clock at the end of the game. But. I, I liked what I saw, you know, he, he did make some bad throws early on, he, he soared one over the head of, I want to say, Demario Douglas, and he overthrew on another pass, yes, there was bad, but there was also good, like, there was good that I haven't seen in a long time, you know, deep, deep throws that were on target, inaccurate, touchdown passes of over 20 yards, uh, things like that that were exciting, and, yeah, he's, he's an athletic dude, so, gonna have to work on his accuracy in some, some ways, but uh, I liked it, I, I was having a great time watching him, and I think that the future, obviously it's a one game sample size, but I, I'm i more excited for the rest of the year, I didn't know if he should really be starting this early, but in terms of like, quarterback play, it is a huge step up over Jacoby Brissett, so uh, ultimately I liked that they made this decision. After that, we move into a matchup between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the New Orleans Saints. This game, we saw uh, a shootout. It was wildly entertaining in the first half. Had that game up on the split screen, and it was just so unpredictable. Uh, I believe at one point, Tampa Bay was leading 17 to 0, and then I checked back in, and now they're losing 27 to 17, maybe. Uh, 24 at halftime at least. Yeah, the Saints scored 27 points all in the second quarter in this one. The final score ends up being 51-27 in favor of the Buccaneers, and so the Saints did all their scoring in just that quarter. Um, but it made it a very competitive game in the first half. Baker Mayfield in this one goes uh, 24 of 36 for 325 yards, four touchdowns, and three interceptions. The three interceptions all coming in the first half as well. Uh, then, in terms of rushing yards, Richard White out for this game, so we don't have Bucky Irving, we actually have Sean Tucker leading the way with 14 carries, for 136 yards, and a touchdown. Very efficient day from him. And then in the receiving game, big, big Chris Godwin day with 11 receptions for 125 yards and two touchdowns. Then for the Saints, you've got Derek Carr out, so Spencer Rattler gets his first start in the NFL. He goes 22 of 40 for 243 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. In the uh, rushing game, you've got Alvin Kamara with 13 carries for 40 yards and a touchdown. And then in the receiving game, you've got Foster Moreau with two catches for 54 yards. In terms of total offense, it was uh, it was a wash. You have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with 594 total yards of offense to the 303 of the Saints. Uh, I mean, 594 yards, 51 points, and it tracks. Uh, now, in terms of key takeaways on this game, uh, for the for the Bucks, it's it's remarkable what you can accomplish when you have a decent running game. Like uh, Richard White being out for this game, you expect Bucky Irving to take over, but like you don't know how effective that's gonna be. The uh, Buccaneers in this game had 277 rushing yards behind the legs of Irving and Sean Tucker, and this is way better. Like they're one of the worst rushing offenses in the last couple years, and they've been okay with that. They've they've managed to win games. This 
despite that. But when you have it, you've got these like top tier wide receivers, Baker Mayfield playing uh, exceptional football, and then you actually have a viable running game. Like it's scary how good this offense actually could be. So I'd like to see it continue. I, I don't know if it will, but man oh man, do they look crazy good when they have a rushing game going as well. Uh, and then as for the Saints, I don't think it was, I mean, it was a very weird day. Uh, no, no scoring in the first quarter. All scoring in the second quarter, and then completely shut out in the second half. Really, I think it just comes down to um, Spencer Rattler's first start. Like, obviously, you're going to have ups and downs, hiccups here and there. Uh, a solid start in the first half. And then second half, I think he was a bit more flustered. That's where the turnovers came out. And uh, it's not really all on him. The O-line didn't do a great job, allowed him to get sacked five times. Uh, only 81 yards in the rushing game, so I think Spencer Rattler had it he, he decent out there, um, but it's going to come down to just getting him more reps and more time, uh, you know, work through those issues, 27 points in your first start, it, it's pretty impressive, I know that some of it was on special teams, they did get a lot of help from their defense, but uh, you made it competitive, like going into halftime, you're up, so uh, hats off to that, and yeah, just, just give him more time. Alright, after that we've got a matchup between the Cleveland Browns and the Philadelphia Eagles. In this game, the Philadelphia Eagles end up victorious with a final score of 20-16 to over the Browns, uh, moving the Eagles to a 3-2 and record on the year, while the Browns fall to a 1-5 and record. In this game, Deshaun Watson leading the passing group for the Browns, he went 16 of 23 for 168 yards only. Then, in the rushing game, you've got Pierre Strong Jr. with 8 carries for 43 yards. And finally, you've got Amari Cooper with 4 catches for 42 yards. Then, uh, in the Eagles offense, you have Jalen Hurts who went 16 of 25 for 264 yards with 2 touchdowns. Uh, then. In the rushing game, Saquon Barkley, 18 carries for 47 yards. And finally, in the receiving game, A.J. Brown in his return, having a big day, 6 catches for 116 yards and 1 touchdown. Now, in terms of total offense, it was uh, in favor of the Eagles, 372 to 244. And this game was a little bit of a weird one, I will say. The Browns, really not getting anything done on offense. Their one touchdown score in this game was from, uh, I believe, let me just double check on this. Yeah, they, they only scored one touchdown. It was on a block field goal, so their offense really is not cutting it. And that brings me to my main takeaway for the Browns. I think it's time for a quarterback change. Like, uh, there's no way of dancing around it. You have to admit that you failed. You made a horrible trade uh, a couple years ago when you did that one. Got rid of Baker Mayfield. You got Deshaun Watson to one of the largest contracts of guaranteed money. Um, and it was horrible. It was a horrible trade. And it's time to call it quits because you're just ruining your season. This guy can't do anything. He can't really throw it. He's not willing to run it. Uh, and the offense is horrendous. Like, truly, truly horrible. And my, my best example for what a quarterback change can do for you is, like, look at the Panthers. Like, the Panthers. I'll get into their game in a little bit, but it is night and day what their offense can do and not do based on what their what quarterback is in. And I think that, like, I, I can't say that the fans like Deshaun Watson. I'm, I'm sure the fans do not like Deshaun Watson. Maybe they defend his gameplay. But I think as a general, uh, I don't even know how to say it. In like terms of popularity, I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of fans in Cleveland who don't like the like him. <laughs> you know, uh, he's a little bit of a diva, and he just isn't good, and he has all these off-the-field problems. Like, I would hate to employ him. And I would love to bench him if I was a fan. Uh, James Winston, great great charismatic guy right on the bench right there uh, and then for the Eagles offense you put up 376 
yards, but you only had two touchdowns. Um, kind of comes down to the running game. It doesn't look like you had that bad of a day on the ground, but you really did. Uh, yeah, here it shows that you had 116 yards rushing, but you rushed the ball 36 times for an average of 3.2 yards per rush. And I'm going to highlight the main problem here. It was uh, just who was getting stopped between Saquon Barkley and Jalen Hurts. They carried the ball 32 times, and they got 80 yards. <laughs> That's a huge problem. Uh, running game is... Obviously, it's the Browns defense. The Browns defense is solid, so I'm not expecting that to consist, like, to, to come keep staying like that, but my, my, is that horrible. So, Saquon not as effective in this game. Jalen Hurts, I don't know why he's carrying it so many times for so few yards, um, but yeah, it's, the ground game has to be better. Like, your offense can't have this much yardage and this few points. It's not gonna work. You're not gonna be every team like this. And yeah, that's that's about it. And all my thoughts on this game. After that, we move into a a pretty fun game uh, between the Washington Commanders and the Baltimore Ravens. This is one of the few games that I got rolling this week. Um, yeah, last week I had a pretty rough time in my predictions. I ended up going six and eight. My worst week so far. Week five was a wash for me. I, I did not do well at all. And so I'm looking for a strong bounce back here and I did get it. I ended up twelve and two on this week, so very nice. But this was unfortunately one of the games that I got wrong. I was trusting trusting the commanders after doubting them so many times in a row. I thought maybe this is the week that they pulled through. And uh, no, they did not. Baltimore Ravens take the victory in here with the uh, final score of 30 to 23. It, it, was, it was pretty close. Um, but yeah, this brings the Ravens and the Commanders to a 4 2 record on the year. For the Commanders, you've got Jaden Daniels going 24 of 35 for 269 yards, two touchdowns. And then in the rushing game, also Jaden Daniels leading the way with six carries for 22 yards. And then in the receiving game, Zach Ertz with four catches for 68 yards. As for the Ravens, you've got Lamar Jackson going 20 of 26 for 323 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. In the rushing game, you've got Derrick Henry with yet another impressive game. 24 carries for 132 yards and two touchdowns. And finally, in the receiving game, big game for Zay Flowers. He had nine catches for 132 yards. In terms of total offense, it was heavily in favor of Baltimore. They get 484 yards to the 305 of Washington. Now, in terms of key takeaways, uh, talking about the commanders, I think it's not that hard to understand. Uh, really, they were limited in the ground game. We've seen Washington rush for up to 200 yards in a game this season. Uh, in this game, they only had 52, and probably a large part of that is Brian Robinson Jr. being out. Uh, I know last week they got over 200, and they did it mostly, or like partially without him. And I said, like, wow, you can you can really accomplish a lot if you're going to rush that much. Uh, but Brian Robinson Jr. not being there, they could not really run the ball. It was failed attempts by Eckler, by Nichols Jr., even Jaden Daniels didn't have that much success on the ground. And yeah, it made their offense one-dimensional. Jaden Daniels as a passer did the best that he could, but they, they're just missing a running game in this one. And then as for the Ravens, uh, I think it's it's time to... I mean, obviously you could have done it a couple games ago, but like it's time to admire how good of a move the Derrick Henry acquisition was because, like, first two weeks it was a little rough. Um, Jeep's game, obviously, he didn't get a lot of touches. And then you have weird just, uh, post-game presser from John Harbaugh saying that, like, oh, you know, don't expect those old games where he's getting, like, 25 touches in a game. Uh, that's not the Derrick Henry that we're gonna see here. And it's like, why would you get him and then not use him? Uh, but, like, it's safe to say that it was just lying, because he got 24 carries this week, and, yeah, they're using him how you would imagine a team would use Derrick Henry, and he doesn't look as, like, bum inefficient anymore, so, uh, it, four straight wins for the Ravens, 
a lot behind the legs of Derrick Henry. Uh, it has made them very fearsome, and yeah, just got a deeper hat off to it. He is having one heck of a year, once again, uh, leading the league in rushing yards, and yeah, he's just that good, even at age 30. Alright, I am back from class, so let's get back into it now. Next up, we have a matchup between the Los Angeles Chargers and the Denver Broncos. In this game, the Los Angeles Chargers would walk, walk away with the victory at a final score of 23-16 to over the Broncos. This puts the Chargers at a record of 3-2 and and brings the Denver Broncos down to a record of 3-3. Three and -three. Now, in this game, we had Justin Herbert passing for what I think is the most passing yards in any game this season. He finishes 21 of 34 for 237 yards and a score. In the rushing game, we've got J.K. Dobbins uh, carrying the ball an impressive 25 times, but only for 96 yards. Uh, not horribly inefficient, but not as good as you would hope for uh, in one touchdown. And then in the receiving game, you have Falco. Uh, Let's find out what Falco's first name is. Simi, Simi Falco, getting the uh, most yards of any of the wideouts. He finishes with two catches for 44 yards. Now on the Denver Broncos side of things, we have Bo Nix going 19 of 33 for 216 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. In the rushing game, we also have Bo Nix leading the way with six carries for 61 yards. And then finally, in the receiving game, we've got uh, Don Vele, I believe it is. No, Devon, not Don, Devon Vele, uh, with four catches for 78 yards in this one. In terms of total offense, it has a slight advantage to the Chargers in this matchup, with 350 total yards to the 316 of the Denver Broncos. Now, in terms of takeaways for this game, uh, let's start with the Chargers. I would like to see them bring back the deep ball. I don't know why they have completely phased this out of their game, but we know what Justin Ar Herbert's arm talent is like. We know that he can sling it like 80 yards down the field. And I think that that is something we very much could still be seeing. I mean, maybe they don't think they have the wideout talent, um, but it kind of seems like it's been taken out of their game plan. They are fully leaning into this rush first offense, and we saw Justin Herbert do more, just have more of a role in this game, and I think overall it was beneficial, but I think that they can bring back more deep shots. Like, you can be a run first team that also does throw the ball down the field. Um, and yeah, we know that Justin Herbert is capable of it, so I'd like to see just a couple more attempts. Like, we haven't seen any real success with the deep ball in this format so far. Um, under the new regime, obviously you're at a winning record, but uh, I think that would that would be great if Justin Herbert can throw for a consistent, like, 200 and you have over 100 rushing yards. Well, ideally more than 100, uh, but... Yeah, I, I, I would like to see their game plan bring that back. You don't have to rely on his arm every single week, but just try, try more vertical routes. And then as for the Broncos, um, I think the real takeaway is that the Broncos need a running back. Bo Nix finishing as the leading rusher in this game. We take a look at how their, their running back room actually did. You've got Javante Williams with Six carries for 23 yards, averaging only 3.8 yards per carry. Uh, Audric Estime with two carries for 13 yards. Julio McLaughlin, three carries for eight yards. Overall, in terms of running backs, there were 11 carries by running Denver Broncos running backs in this game, and they got maybe 45 yards. Uh, that's not going to do it. You do need a rushing game. Uh, you need a real running back. I don't think that Javante Williams is the answer. He's coming off a pretty major injuries. He doesn't look that good. He hasn't been that good this season. Um, and I don't think Jaleel McLaughlin's the answer either. You're going to have to go out and get a real running back. Um, and that is the next step for this team because Bonex is developing. Like, he has thrown some of those touchdowns. Um, he's, he's pretty adequate as a rusher as well, but his wideouts are getting it done for the time being, and his running backs aren't, so that's the next way to help him in this offensive scheme. After that,
said, we move into our next matchup, which was between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Las Vegas Raiders. In this game, the Steelers would dominate the Raiders with a final score of 32-13. to This pushes the Steelers to a 4-2 record on the year, while the Raiders fall to a record of 2-4. Uh, in this game, we saw Justin Fields throw four, 14 of 24 passes uh, and only get 145 passing yards. And then in the rushing game, Najee Harris carried the ball 14 times for 106 yards and one touchdown. And then finally, in the receiving game, we've got George Pickens with three catches for 53 yards. And finally, uh, on the Raiders' side of things, we had Aiden O'Connell making the start, gaining uh, 27 of 40 passes completed for 227 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. In the rushing game, we've got Alexander Madison with 14 carries for only 33 yards and a touchdown. Um, you know, still filling in for the injured Samir White. And then finally, Brock Bowers. Uh, he had nine catches for 71 yards. A very productive year for the rookie tight end. Uh, in terms of total offense, we have slight advantage to the Steelers in this one. 293 total yards to the 275 of the Raiders. Uh, and as far as takeaways go, I'd say for the Steelers, your defense is back. Uh, you know, you had two games slip. You lost to the Colts. You lost to the Cowboys. And both those games were giving up 27 points at least. Uh, and in this game, you you get it back. You limit the Raiders to only 13. You force a lot of turnovers. One of them was a DJ Watt goal line fumble, uh, forced fumble. And so that's that's really your key to winning games. It's going to have to rely on your defense. Your offense is not moving that many people. It's not, it's like, it's it's okay. It's very middle of the pack. Rushing game is solid, but yeah, through the air, it's like here and there. And it does have to rely on the defense, so your defense returns to form, and that is great news for the Steelers. As for the Raiders, um, I think that they really do need Samir White back. Um, Samir White, maybe not the most efficient of backs, but you do need a more like bruising, powerful running back that can take over for this team. Because right now, this tandem of Alexander Madison and Amir Abdullah are uh, truly, truly preventing them from doing anything. Like, when it comes down to it, Aiden O'Connell threw the ball 40 times in this game. You're not going to win a single game in which Aiden O'Connell is throwing the ball 40 times. You need to have a good run game so you can keep the ball out of his hands as much as possible. Like, look at the way that they beat Kansas City last year. Aiden O'Connell did not complete a pass after, like, the first quarter, and they won that game. And I do think that there's a correlation there. Aiden O'Connell is not winning you games. He is. He's there. <laughs> He's the guy that's in there. That's how I view him. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're going to want to up the running game 50 seven rushing yards to the 183 of the Steelers. It's a big reason why the Raiders lost here. They're going to need to be much better as a run, like a running team if you're going to have Ian O'Connell play quarterback. Just no beating the bush around it. Um, yeah, and then after that, we move into the matchup between the Detroit Lions and the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, this was brutal if you're a Cowboys fan. The Lions would absolutely tear down the Cowboys at home. The Lions win this game 47-9, uh, moving to a record of 4-1 and one on the year, while Dallas falls back down to 3-3, three and three, uh, right at 500. In this game, we had Jared Goff going 18 of 25 for 315 yards and 3 touchdowns. In the rushing game, David Montgomery leading the you know, running back duo that the Lions have with 12 carries for 80 yards and two scores. And then finally in the receiving game, we've got J-Mo or Jameson Williams with three catches for 76 yards and a score. As for the Cowboys, it was not a day to remember. You have 17 of 33 for 178 and two interceptions from Mr. $60 million contract, Dak Prescott himself. After that, Rico Dowdle leading the running back room with five carries for 25 yards. Honestly, not that bad, but five carries. <laughs> and then CeeDee Lamb with a, a somewhat decent day, uh, seven catches for 89 yards total. In terms of total offense, it was uh, largely in favor of the Lions, almost doubling up the Cowboys, 492 yards of offense to the 251 of Dallas. And as far as takeaways, uh, two things. One of them for the Lions, it really seems like Dan 
Campbell hates the Cowboys after what happened last year. Uh, we saw this game start and end with, uh, not Eric Decker, Dan Skipper. <laughs> uh, not Dan Skipper either. Decker. Taylor Decker. There you go. There it is. Um, Taylor Decker reporting as eligible in the first play of the game and the last play of the game. They didn't utilize it, but they're definitely trolling and taunting from their matchup last year. And I think they, they piled on the points because they were so mad with what happened in the matchup last year in which, you know, you had the, the illegal substitution and then the penalty and eventually Dallas takes the two seed. Um, and so, yeah, with that, you see Dan Campbell just on the sidelines like absolutely furious even though his team is up so much and uh, he made it a point to destroy Dallas in this game and uh, on the Cowboys end of things it's it's bad offensively it is bad um you know for starters your running game sucks it is horrible horrendous Ezekiel Elliott and Rico Dowdle that is just not that good of a duo in total uh, I think what Durbin, Cooper Rush, Lamb, and Prescott, they all had one carry each. In total, your running back output from this game was 13 carries for 42 yards. 42 yards. In total, you had 53 rushing yards in this game, and Detroit had 184. So that's not going to do it. Along with that, if your running game is dookie, you can't have your... your $60 million quarterback turning the ball over so much. We saw two end zone turnovers last week and this week we saw another red zone pick uh, end zone pick really and uh, yeah it's just like you can't afford to have a turnover prone offensive passing game and a horrible running game it's just not going to work. Like this is what happens when Dallas stacks against a good team last week. Uh, you could you could make the argument that the Steelers were good and they made it out, but they they did make a lot of mistakes two weeks ago against the Giants. A lot of penalties this week. We saw them play like an actual top dog team in the South they perform. So it's not looking good. They also crumbled in some of their other performances like uh, week two and week against the Ravens. It just not good. And, yeah, the other thing for the Lions, Aiden Hutchinson, just want to bring that up, um, very unfortunate what happened to him. If you haven't seen it, I would proceed with caution. He left the field, I believe, in the third quarter with a leg injury, and he, he is done for the year. A uh, broken tibia. It is, like, it's, like, limp in the video. You can tell it's clearly broken, and, uh, just truly a tragedy, because this guy was dominating defensively, uh, early lead for defensive player of the year, uh, just an absolute force, and, uh, yeah, let the lead in the sacks, truly like the, uh, a young emerging star, and he's gonna be done for the year, uh, and I hope that the Lions can, uh, rally around this injury and play for him, because obviously a big loss to their defense, and just, uh, terrible for the guy, because he, he was having such a good season, and, yeah, yeah, you just gotta feel for him. Anyway, after that, we move into a matchup between the Atlanta Falcons and the Carolina Panthers. In this game, the Falcons ultimately end up winning with a final score of 38-20 to over the Panthers, bringing the Falcons to a 4-2 and record and the Panthers down to a 1-5 record on the season. In this one, we had Kirk Cousins going 19-30 of for 225 yards and a score. Tyler Algier once again leading this uh, Falcons backfield with 18 carries for 105 yards and a touchdown. And then in the receiving game, uh, another nice streak London game with six catches for 74 yards and a score. Then for the Panthers, we've got Andy Dalton with 26 of 38 passing for 221 yards, two touchdowns, but also two interceptions. Then Chubba Hubbard, another adequate day. Um, 18 carries for 92 yards. He's been averaging right around that 90 to 100 range. Uh, honestly, he's playing quite well. And then for Deontay Johnson, he returns to form as well. Six catches for 78 yards and a score. He has been very productive with Andy Dalton in at quarterback in all weeks except last week. 
Uh, as far as total offense goes, you had 423 from the Falcons, uh, following up on their historic performance a week before, and then 335 from the Carolina Panthers. Now, in terms of key takeaways, uh, for, for the Falcons, it's, it's the offense. Like, the offense has truly found itself after a rough couple opening games from Kirk Cousins and company. Uh, they truly have found their footing in this game. They went 4 of 8 from, in terms of red zone uh, efficiency. And I, I've got to applaud that. You know, 8 red zone trips is immaculate. Uh, if you could make the red zone 8 times in a game, it doesn't even matter if you want 50. Like, a lot of teams don't even convert 50% of the time, but 50% conversion rate in the red zone, and you made it 8 times. This is a crazy productive offense. Uh, through the last two weeks, they have like 900-something, 900 950 yards of offense. It is absolutely rolling. Um, and then, as for the Panthers, I I don't really want to bunch down on them. I think that they actually played very well in this game. Uh, they have been such an improved offense and team with Andy Dalton in at quarterback. If you take a look at the box score, you're going to see 38-20, to 20, and you're going to think like, oh, they almost doubled them up in points. It was clearly a huge Falcons victory. But the game wasn't that far out of the Panthers' hands. Like, it was almost neck and neck in the fourth quarter. You start the fourth quarter off, the Panthers have the ball, they're driving it down the field, they actually get into red zone, like, range. Uh, I want to say they're like 15 yards away from scoring. The score at this point is 28 to 20. So with the score, you you could potentially tie the game. You could make it a one possession game. Uh, ideally, like, let's say they score as a touchdown. It's 27-28. It's a one point game at that point. But it just happened to get away, away from them at the very end. You have uh, Andy Dalton throwing a pick. And then uh, you know, Panthers are more in desperation mode because the Falcons score, so they go for it on fourth down, they don't convert, and then they throw another pick. But ultimately, through three quarters of football, you were playing great. Like, you were right there. You were almost going to make this a very competitive game against the Falcons, and the Falcons are, uh, you know, they're at a 4 and 2 record, so don't hang your heads too low. I do think that the Panthers team. They made the right decision. Like, after analyzing for a couple weeks, Bryce Young was definitely holding this team back, and Andy Dalton is a much improved option. With last week, we thought, like, you saw Andy Dalton, now he did against that Bears team, but really, I think that's more of a testament to the Bears defense. Uh, after these four performances from him, it truly is, like, the Panthers aren't that bad. Yeah, they might be at a 1-5 record, but they are way better than they were when they had Bryce Young in. So, just want to acknowledge that and see where this team goes. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anywho, after that, we finally move into our Sunday night game. This is a matchup between the Cincinnati Bengals and the New York Giants. Uh, this game had me pretty frustrated for fantasy reasons, and ultimately the Bengals would end up winning this game with a final score of 17-7 over the Giants. Uh, not an ideal game to watch, I would say, on primetime TV. Lots of punting and turnovers and things like that. In this game, we had Joe Burrow going 19-28 of 28 for 208 yards, no passing touchdowns. Uh, in the rushing game, we also had Joe Burrow leading the way with four carries for 55 yards in one touchdown, including his uh, career long in terms of a rushing touchdown. He broke away for a 47-yarder. And then in the receiving game, we've got T. Higgins with seven catches for 77 yards. As for the Giants, we've got Daniel Jones going 22 of 41 for 205 yards and an interception. In the rushing game, we've also got Daniel Jones with 11 carries for 56 yards. And in the passing game, uh, Malik Neighbors still out with that concussion. So you've got Darius Slayton with six catches for 57 yards. In terms of total offense, it was almost, almost dead even. Uh, with Cincinnati getting 304 and New York getting 309. Um, and yeah, this is actually a very weird one because uh, they were both even in turnovers. New York actually had way more first downs than Cincinnati. Uh, 24 to 13 was their favor, and uh, New York had possession, like higher time of possession. They allowed fewer sacks. There were more uh, 
successful in the red zone, they committed fewer penalties. Um, so in almost every way, <laughs> New York was a better team. And it really just came down to, I guess, one, their kicker, and number two, their rushing ability. Um, New York averaging 3.8 yards per rush to the 6.1 of the Bengals, but that number is inflated, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, and yeah, it was, it was an interesting game for the Giants. Anywho, uh, as far as like takeaways go, yeah, let's talk about the, the Bengals' rushing abilities. They don't have a good run game. Uh, that is probably their biggest flaw in this in this matchup. They had 13 first downs, only three of them rushing. Uh, and, you know, you see the, the score, yeah, 121 rushing yards. That's what they were given, um, or that's what they earned in this game. But majority of that came off of two runs very late in the game. You've got Chase Brown breaking away for a 30-yard game-winning touchdown, basically. Well, not game-winning, they were already ahead, but game-sealing touchdown. And, uh, you have Joe Burrow on that 47-yarder, so if you take 77 of those yards, the rest of the game, there was 18 carries for... What would it even be? Uh... 43, yeah, so averaging less than 3 yards per hour, right around there, uh, it's, no, way less, way less, yeah, um, either way, uh, rushing game was horrible, Zach Moss fumbled the ball, Chase Brown, pretty bad day, except for that one r touchdown rush, uh, he kind of like made it up more on that one, as a Joe Burrow through the air was having a more difficult time, he was lighting it up the last couple weeks, and this week, he got stopped through the air, and they just had nothing in the running game, so that I think is their biggest flaw at the moment, you're gonna want to figure that out, um, and I mean, you got the win though, and as for the Giants, Greg Joseph has to go in, uh, he single-handedly lost you in this game, I would say. But take a look at the Giants towards the end of this game. They, uh, well, first off, I don't know what the Giants were thinking, <laughs> but their first drive in the second half, they go for it on fourth down at their own 38-yard line. Like, uh, that was definitely a decision. I don't know why they wanted to do that, but... That was something that they did. I mean, it didn't cost them anything because the Bengals fumbled immediately after, but like, that was definitely a boneheaded decision. And then here, this is what happened with, so the Bengals fumble. After that, New York scores a touchdown, so it's 7-7. Then the Bengals, they have a field goal, so they're leading 10-7. The Giants string together a drive, and they have a missed 47-yard field goal at the end. If they had made it, that's 10-10. The Bengals get the ball, they punt it. Then the Giants, they get the ball, drive it down the field, and instead of going for a field goal, it would have been like a 52-yarder. They just saw Greg Joseph miss, and so instead they decide to go for it on fourth and two, and they fail to convert. So uh, ideally, if your kicker can make kicks, then you go for a 52-yard field goal. And let's say that he makes it. Now you're up 13-10. Then the Giants, they... Sorry, not the Giants. Uh, the Bengals, at this point, they were really just trying to run out the clock. But they wouldn't be thinking of running out the clock. They do score a touchdown on this drive. Um, and that puts them up 17-7. to seven. But if you had those other two field goals, it would be 17 13, and then Greg Joseph misses another kick, a uh, 45-yarder, and so like, yes, at the end of the day, maybe you look at the three missed opportunities, and you could say like, why well, you still lose the game 17, 16, but it does change the other teams, everything, everything that the other team is doing, scheming, the way that they're going to approach the game is different, because you not only missed your first kick, but then you failed to go for the other kick, and it's just like, yeah, if you can't rely 
rely on your kicker to make 40 yard field goals then you need a new kicker uh, they, they, they could have won this game probably if they had a better kicker um, it was it's really you, you put up 7 points and you could have had 9 more if your kicker was good so I think it's time for a kicking switch that's, that's really the biggest takeaway <laughs> After that, we move into our Monday night matchup between the Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets. Uh, in this game, the Buffalo Bills come out on top with a final score of 23-20 to 20 over the Jets. The Bills move to a 4-2 record on the year, while the Jets fall to 2-4. Josh Allen goes 19 of 25 for 215 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, no James Cook in this game, so we've got Ray Davis filling in for him with 20 carries for 97 yards. Not bad at all. And then in the receiving game, we also have Ray Davis with three catches for 55 yards. For the Jets, we've got 23 of 35 passes completed for Aaron Rodgers for 294 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. Brees Hall uh, comes back to life in this one with 18 carries for 113 yards. And in the passing game, you've got uh, Alan Lazard with six catches for 114 yards and a touchdown. A very cool touchdown. I would uh, recommend you check it out. Aaron Rodgers, the king of the Hail Mary, completed yet another one at the end of the first half in this game. Um, all the way back past the 50-yard line, he launches it into the end zone and Alan Lazard catches the ball. Uh, it does get knocked loose towards the end, but he had already like completed the process of a catch. And so, yeah, the, the Hail Mary made it a 17-20 to 20 game heading into half. And it was, it was cool. It was very cool to see. In terms of total offense, we actually have New York outperforming Buffalo in this one, um, with New York having 393 yards of offense to the 359 of the Bills. And as far as key takeaways go, first up, uh, for the Bills, <laughs> my key takeaway for this game is uh, that the Bills' wide receiver room sucks. And this is pretty evident, because if you take a look at their box score and who was catching passes in this game, first guy on the list is Ray Davis, your backup running back. Uh, he had three catches for 55 yards. And then after that, you've got Dalton Kincaid, your tight end, with six catches for 51 yards. And then the rest of the guys, it's Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, Khalil Shaker, and Mac Hollins. They combine for six, eight, nine passes caught in this game. Uh, and no one getting more than 44 yards. It is truly amazing that the Bills are at the record that they are. Uh, they get back into the win column after two straight losses, and they desperately needed an upgrade at wide receiver, which they have addressed, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But yeah, their wide receiver room is not good. It was not cutting it. And then as for the Jets, takeaway from this game is actually a positive one. I know that you lost, but really, you weren't far from winning it. Uh, if you take a look at how the game panned out, Greg Zerline misses a kick that would have tied the game very late into the game. Uh, would it have tied it or given them the lead? It actually would have given them the lead. They were tied 20-20, and Zerline missed the 43-yarder. Uh, he also missed another 32-yarder. Oh my goodness, I did not see that one. That That is horrible. He really could have won this game. I mean, the Bills also missed the kick, so let's say it evens out and you're even, but like, my goodness, two missed kicks. And then, uh, final drive of the game, they throw an interception. And so, that's two weeks in which, with the game on the line, and Aaron Rodgers is throwing a pick. Uh, obviously, with the Vikings, it was much more close to actually scoring and being a happy ending. But here he throws the pick, the comeback is immediately put to rest. And yeah, you, you definitely could have had it. But the positive takeaway is that the offense actually looks a lot better under Todd Downing. Uh, Robert Sala getting fired from this team. You have a lot of coaching uh, shifts. And so Todd Downing takes over as offensive play caller. You've got Jeff Albright taking over as the uh, interim head coach. And under Todd Downing, the offense, it, it looks serviceable. You've got over 100 yards rushing from Brees.
Humphreys. Oh, he, he had been completely bottled in the last two games, so he is back. Aaron Rodgers throws for nearly 300 yards. Obviously, a big chunk of that does come on the Hail Mary, but as a whole, you outperformed the other team in offense, and you had, uh, I think it was a first quarter touchdown. They hadn't done that in a long time. In a lot of ways, this was better. If you account for the two missed field goals, uh, that's 26 points of offense, and so uh, for a first game as a play caller, I, I think that is a positive sign. Oh, overall, I think that they did look better uh, taking the play calling abilities away from Nathaniel Hackett, and so good decision overall. And you also made a move, so both these teams making moves, uh, blockbuster moves. And I think we're ready to get into that segment of the video. Alright, so now that we've covered all of the recap elements, uh, all the matchups from this last week, let's talk about some of the biggest news headlines that have appeared. Uh, we're going to start with the injuries in this week. There were quite a lot, actually. Uh, these are more fantasy-oriented, so it's going to be more skill positions and things like that. So first up, we've got Marvin Harrison Jr. of the Arizona Cardinals. He is out with a concussion. Uh, he does have to go through the concussion protocols. We'll see how long he, he takes to get out of that. But he is, was ruled out for this game, and uh, we'll have to see if he is able to make it back for week seven. After that, you've got Jerome Ford, running back of the Cleveland Browns, out with a hamstring injury. He has been marked as week to week by Kevin Stefanski. Then, Dondavian Wicks, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers. He exited the game with a shoulder injury, and he is also being listed as week-to-week. -week. Next up, Travis Etienne. He had another hamstring injury. He was already dealing with a shoulder injury, and now he has a hamstring injury. Uh, once again, labeled as week-to-week. -week. Uh, after that, we've got Chris Olave, wide receiver of the New Orleans Saints, and he was ruled out with a concussion. Um, on a, on a very brutal hit, like a targeting type hit, uh, straight to the noggin, and he will have to pass through concussion protocol as well, so we'll see when he returns. And then Rashid Shahid, other wide receiver for the New Orleans Saints, out with an unknown knee injury. Uh, they're waiting on an MRI. They, it's, it's been labeled as worrisome or troublesome, but we don't know exactly what it is yet. Then for the Philadelphia Eagles, you've got Dallas Goddard with a hamstring injury as well. Uh, no, no formal word on how long he'll be out for, but uh, he did have to leave the game. And then Ty J Spears, uh, running back for the Tennessee Titans, also being ruled out with a hamstring injury, and his status is week to week. Now we've done the injuries. Now we can talk about the trades. There were some big trades that occurred today, random Tuesday afternoon, uh, or Tuesday morning, depending on where you live. We've got, first up, Devontae Adams to the Jets. Uh, this is a move that I think everyone was expecting at some point to happen, speculating it would happen. The old reunion between Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers. Just because we know that Devontae Adams is somewhat disgruntled in Las Vegas. The quarterback play is abysmal. You had Jimmy Garoppolo, then you had Dan O'Connell, now you've got Gardner Minshew and Dan O'Connell, and none of that is the Derek Carr that he went there for. So, he was in a bad situation. Aaron Rodgers in this Jets offense, they had Garrett Wilson, but they were leaning a lot on their other guys. They bring back a former wide receiver one for Aaron Rodgers, you know, his favorite wide receiver. And, yeah, um, making big changes, fired Robert Sala, now you've got the top dog back in the building, they were already reunited earlier today on the Pat McAfee, McAfee show, so they've been plotting, they've been waiting for this one, and yeah, it'll be cool to see them back together. Then, the Bills, the Buffalo Bills, addressing their wide receiver concerns, I just talked about how they have no real good wide receivers, and I think they agreed, they trade for Amari Cooper uh, from the Browns, in a huge move, you know, getting Amari Cooper, you have your sure shot wide receiver one on this offense now, he comes at a very, very low cost to the team, because of how much the Browns guaranteed his contract, they're only gonna have to pay him like 900 something thousand dollars, uh, huge, huge move for the Bills here. Um, hopping out Josh Allen, and then 
as for the Browns, like, I think that this is them waving their, their white flag. I think they realize that their season is doomed. They're cooked. It's, like, your, your offense was so bad, and you just got rid of your best offensive piece. Like, obviously, um, Nick Chubb has been out, and so, with him gone, Amari Cooper was your best offensive weapon, and he is gone. So, this team is, I think, giving up and kind of sad to see, but at the same time, like, what else can you really do? And, yeah, after that, we also had Cam Akers getting traded to the Vikings from the Texans, um, in a move that, like, I don't really know what to make of it. You had Ty Chandler, you still have Ty Chandler, Aaron Jones is out, um, so that one's not nearly as significant, but it is something that happened. And yeah, with all of that, let us talk about the week seven waiver wire. We finally made it to the waiver wire segment of this video. So let's get into it in next week's action. Here are some quick pickups you can add to uh, improve your odds of winning, hopefully. So starting off with the quarterbacks, I've got three quarterback recommendations for you heading into week seven. First up is Bo Nix, quarterback of the Denver Broncos. Now, the rationale behind him, he has six touchdowns in the last three weeks. I know early on in this season, a big talking point was through three weeks, we had not seen a rookie quarterback throw a passing touchdown in the league, uh, but that has definitely changed at this point. We've seen five through the air and one on the ground. Uh, Bo Nix actually has three rushing touchdowns on the year. And so, he's coming off back-to-back 20-plus -back point performances. He's averaging six carries a week in a backfield that really is a mess and doesn't have, like, a good running back. And so, with his rushing upside, his good performances, and the fact that he's, like, getting in rhythm and he has five passing touchdowns the last three weeks, I think it's time to think of him as, like, a viable plug-and-play uh, type, type of guy. Like, go out and get him if you need a quarterback that badly. Uh, I think he's definitely worth looking into. Next up, we're going to talk about another rookie uh, quarterback, and this is Drake May. Drake May, in his debut with the Patriots, throws for three touchdowns. He also rushed seven times for 38 yards, I believe it was. And so, uh, pretty promising. You know, he can scramble, he can pick up some on his feet. He has shown his ability to throw the deep ball, the intermediate ball, uh, through for three touchdowns. Now, that's not going to happen every week, but lucky for you, he is playing the Jaguars this week, and the Jaguars have had a porous secondary, uh, one of the worst defenses against wideouts and other quarterbacks. And so, uh, yeah, very easy matchup for Drake May. He should be able to feast on them, uh, maybe even match or surpass. Like, he made a lot of mistakes. Let's say that he takes away one of those turnovers, those three turnovers. He, he'll finish with 21 points. He, and so, yeah, that's pretty big. You're going to want to look at him. And then finally, we've got a, a bit of a stash, but uh, we've got Russell Wilson making his first start for the Steelers this Sunday against the Jets. Russell Wilson yet to play a snap so far this season. He was rehabbing an injury, and they finally say that he's good to go, so he's going to take over for the team. The team's sitting at a 4-2 and two record, uh, so I guess they, they want him in now that he's healthy, but... Not an ideal matchup. The Jets' defense is quite good. Uh, Russell Wilson hasn't played in a bit, so first game back, I wouldn't trust him. I definitely would not play him this week, but in terms of, like, if you want to see what he has, I would go out and get him, make him a, a bench addition, not like a good stash option. Maybe, like, in an easier week, he will go off, and then you'll wish you had him. Next up, we have running backs. Uh, this week, I've got three running backs for you. Two of them are really just repeats from last week. Uh, first up, we've got Tyrone Tracy Jr. of the New York Giants. As of right now, he is owned in about 45% of leagues, which falls below the 50% threshold that we do our waiver wire ads for. Um, if you missed it this week, he finished as the overall running back 5, so top 5 finish uh, if you didn't get him last week. Now is your chance. Uh, and the thing that I like the most about his game this week, like, Last week, he was very effective as a runner. Got a bunch of yards on not that many touches. Devin Singletary out again, and he wasn't nearly as productive in the ground game, but he was super involved in the passing game. Like, so many. 
many catches, so many targets. Oh, uh, and that's something you can't overlook. So even with Devin Sequinari coming back, I think that Tyrone Tracy Jr. is a good addition, and he's definitely earned himself more reps for this New York Giants backfield. Next up, we've got Tank Bixby. Uh, Tank Bixby did see a giant shoot up in ownership after last week. He finished as the overall running back one, I believe it was, and yeah, this week he did have more of a bum week, and that's not really his fault. They had a tougher matchup against the Bears, but with Travis Etienne being out and listed as week to week with a hamstring injury, uh, it is time for Tank Bixby to shine. He's going to get that full workload, maybe split a few touches with Dearness Johnson in the passing game, but uh, with Tank Bixby already cutting into Etienne's workload so much, now he actually has the whole thing, so definitely go out and get him if he's available. 44% of leagues have him right now, so he's available 56% of leagues. And then finally, uh, we've got a like deeper ad, uh, and this is Kimani Vidal. Kimani Vidal, the running back for the Los Angeles Chargers. He's a guy that I talked a lot about during um, the draft, in the drafting process, uh, just because he was a very productive college running back, great in yards after contact, uh, had a bunch of yards for his division, and Gus Edwards going on IR finally bumped Kamani Vidal into an active status. He wasn't playing games, J.K. Dobbins had really taken over, but in his first outing, first game uh, as an NFL player, he did very well. He had 13 points, and I would say that just looking at the philosophy for this team, you've got a, a rush-heavy offense for the Chargers. They gave J.K. Dobbins 27 touches in this game, and that is not sustainable. J.K. Dobbins has a huge injury history. Gus Edwards is on the IR. Come on, Vidal, young guy, fresh legs. And he just had a decent game in his opening uh, matchup. He also has great... Wow, I wonder what this is supposed to say. Uh, I wrote that he has a great matchup against Cars. Cars maybe meaning Carolina or the Chargers playing this week. <laughs> Uh, 
they are number 32 in yards per reception allowed. So he doesn't even need any yards after the catch. If Nakano can just get the ball to him, he can produce. I think it is ideal uh, to try and see what he's got. And yeah, finally, our last wide receiver addition is Juju Smith Schuster. Uh, if you recall from two weeks ago, he had a pretty monster game with like seven catches for 130 yards, I believe it was. And yeah, he is slated to take over a lot of the wide receiver duties on this Kansas City offense. Defenses are going to focus in more on Travis Kelsey and I think more on Xavier Worthy because of his game-changing speed. So top, the, the lid of the, the defense is going to be taken off by Xavier Worthy. They're going to be pretty deep trying to cover him. And then Travis Kelsey also is a huge threat. So they might try and double him. And that leaves Juju Smith-Schuster to play clean up. He's going to get a lot of the other targets. And um, yeah, I, I think that the game two weeks ago shows what he what his value is with Rasheed Rice out for the rest of the year. And yeah, I would go and pick him up now that he's off his bye week. After that, we can move into our tight ends. In the tight end category, I only have two additions because tight ends are so atrociously bad. Um, first up, we've got Kate Otten. This is the third week in a row that I'm recommending him. He is owned in 24% of leagues only. Uh, once again, the third option on this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. He saw six targets this week, uh, caught a touchdown, and next week he has an easy matchup against the Baltimore Ravens pass funnel uh, um, defense. I have offense written, but it's defense. Uh, pass funnel, meaning that Baltimore's number one priority is to eliminate the running game and then have you beat them through the air. And so we've seen that week in and week out. That's what they try and do. And so if they are going to limit the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the ground game, that means through the air, uh, they should be throwing the ball a lot, and Kate Otten will definitely benefit from that. And then the second tight end addition is going to be Hunter Henry, 18% of leagues he has owned. Uh, once again, Drake May taking over. This is an elevated offense. This week, he's saw five targets, and he got a touchdown, and they're going to be playing the Jaguars. The Jaguars are one of the weaker defenses. Uh, a winnable game out in London. Hunter Henry, he is decent, like, yeah, uh, you're really just trusting the quarterback and that he can do better, but five targets is a, it's a fair amount for tight ends this year, like, only Brock Bowers is seeing, like, a consistent high number, really, even Travis Kelsey isn't seeing all that many, so with five targets, that's enough to be fantasy relevant and just catching a touchdown. Maybe we see more of that uh, from Drake May. And then finally, we can move into the defenses. We've got two defense and special teams blogs for this week. If you are a defensive streamer like I am, you've got first up the Buffalo Bills defense. And this is based on one thing and one thing only the fact that they're playing the Tennessee Titans. Uh, in pretty much every week, except for the week against Miami, the strategy has worked. Uh, your defense puts up a decent number of points. I guess last week it wasn't amazing. The Colts only put up like five points. Um, but, yeah, in, in general, Tennessee is very turnover prone. And the Bills, we've seen them dominate some of the worst teams, like the Dolphins and the Jags. Their defense put up well over ten points in those matchups. So, playing against a turnover heavy game, like, uh, Tennessee, where Will Levis is throwing for 95 yards and an interception, I think that you can take advantage to grab the Bills defense. And then the other favorable defense uh, is going to be the Bengals, the Cincinnati Bengals. They have a very easy matchup against the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland Browns offense has sucked all year long. They have been one of the worst. They can't score more than 18 points. Even last week, they still could not do it. They actually didn't score a touchdown at all. Uh, it was just the fact that they scored on special teams. And so they also lose their two of their biggest playmakers in Jerome Ford and Amari Cooper. So we're going to see like a very, very disheveled Cleveland Browns offense and the Bengals can take over on defense. Um, and so, yeah, with that, we are done with our week seven waiver wire. And that concludes this video as a whole. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, let me know what you think of the new mic setting I turned down.
down the gain a little bit, I turned down the background noise, I did hear a bit more of my roommate's, like, clatter, uh, uh, chatter, chatter, and, like, talking. Uh, I don't know if you could hear the microwave when it went off or not, but that is something I am concerned about, so just overall, how does the sound come off? Do you enjoy 